On behalf of the American Physical Society, welcome to the Kavli Foundation plenary session entitled Our Changing View of the Universe. We are very grateful for the support of the Kavli Foundation in enabling this special plenary session. A hallmark of the Kavli Foundation is its support for groundbreaking, forefront scientific research. And the speakers today exemplify this in the exciting topics they will address. My name is Ian Shipsey from the University of Oxford. I'm chairing this session. And our first speaker is John Mather from NASA, who will talk about 50 years of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Well, thanks for that uh, lovely but brief introduction, which is good. We've got lots to talk about. So um, thanks also for inviting me to uh, come tell the story of what our community has been up to for uh, many, many more years than just 50. Uh, so I want to uh, sort of begin with uh, before the beginning, see if I can make this computer play, um, to start off with uh, things that came before the cosmic background was thought about. Uh, most of you know these stories, but I always like to remember them myself. Um, in, 19, in 1887, we got the experiment that said there's no ether drift. And uh, Michelson, I believe, thought soon after that that we'd found everything there was to find and was quoted as saying, uh, we got to work on the more decimal places. Uh, so, uh, however, he didn't realize that he had already done the work that demanded a total change of perspective. So Einstein gave us in 1905 that we have relativity, and it's still very puzzling to practically everybody that I know, even though we all know how to to calculate with it the idea that uh, time does not happen or does not pass when you're moving along with a light beam is still kind of shocking for me and many other people. So then Einstein gave us general relativity, uh, adding in the principle of equivalence to the uh, geometrical rep representation of space and time. And, uh, and that was pretty tricky for him to think about. And uh, as I understand it, he was in hot competition with Henri Poincaré and others at the time, but anyway, he got to win that particular battle. Uh, in 1915, by the way, we're now uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of Emmy Nuther's uh, symmetry and conservation theorems that she got from Lagrangian mechanics. And I don't know enough about it to uh, comment further, but uh, it's a nice thing to be able to celebrate this year as well. So then we got that there was a cosmology with a, a lambda constant and a static universe, and we also got uh, an empty universe with an, a lambda constant. And uh, both of those were puzzling because they didn't exactly seem to match reality. So Einstein's uh, cosmology with lambda was unstable, although I don't know how long it took to find that out. <clears throat> so then uh, uh, the people have all heard that uh, Einstein was prejudiced against the expanding universe. Well, there, were <coughs> there might have been good reasons because people didn't know what was out there. In uh, 1912, um, it was just uh, beginning to be discovered that galaxies have redshifts, uh, and we didn't yet know that they were made out of stars, just fuzzy things out there with, uh, with redshifts. So 1914, Zeldovich was born. We celebrated his birthday last year. Um, then the first serious evidence that uh, the uh, nebulae were far away, the gal galaxies are far away, was when a, a nova was found out there in M31. And, uh, but it still didn't sort of penetrate uh, general, general thinking. So Einstein didn't immediately say, well, I know they're really far away. Uh, he just went ahead with his theory of relativity. So uh, it was already in 1922 that Hubble began to resolve the uh, galaxies into stars and Cepheids, and it even turned up in the New York Times in 1924. So, um, Friedman gave us his solution to the expanding universe uh, in 1922, and then he went and died three years after that, so he didn't get to find out that he was right. In 1927, Lemaitre got the same answer again, more or less, uh, and uh, this time was more seriously uh, able to explain it to people. Um, he described the beginning as a primeval atom with unknown physics. Um, and people often wonder, well, how come we don't credit him with uh, inventing Hubble's law? And curiously enough, he translated his own article into English, and some important parts were left out. I don't really know what he was thinking, but uh, he might have gotten a lot more credit for it if he'd included his own uh, pioneering work in that translation. 
So around that time, uh, we're also beginning to want even bigger, bigger telescopes. 1928, can you imagine, before the stock market crash, we're already starting plans to build an even bigger telescope than the Hooker telescope. So 1928, we also began radio astronomy. Uh, this uh, antenna from Ad Bell Labs, uh, I believe this was in Holmdel also, um, detected that there are uh, radio waves from the galaxy and the sun. So uh, then in 1929, Hubble made a plot, and being an observer, I think per, he was perhaps more believed than uh, a theorist, Mr. Lemaitre, um, but he got to draw this plot and showed that there's a proportionality between distance and speed. Uh, and of course, uh, pretty soon we realized, uh, it wasn't very long before we realized that there might be a problem with this because the universe could be younger than the stars in it. So curiously enough, also, Hubble did not particularly like Lemaitre's interpretation of, of the expanding universe. But nevertheless, this was in the front of the New York Times. And Einstein described that as his biggest blunder. Um, although, as you know, he turned out to be right in a different way. So in 1941, uh, we measured the cosmic background radiation, but we didn't know it. And you know this story, too, um, from measuring the rotational temperature of CN molecules in space which you can measure by measuring their UV transitions. And um, of course, nobody thought about it. Nobody was looking for it. Uh, and if, there might also have been many, many other reasons why those molecules might be spinning. 1946, uh, Robert Dickey made a radiometer design and published it. And in principle, you could imagine um, it could have been used even in 1946 to do a measurement of the cosmic background radiation. But it wasn't done that at that time. Also the year that uh, Lyman Spitzer wrote his memo about the advantages of a space telescope. Uh, later on, he even wrote about, well, if we could get an asteroid and carve it out and polish a parab parabolic surface into the asteroid, maybe we'd be able to detect uh, planets around other stars. He even thought at that time about a remote uh, star blocker that could cast a shadow of the star on the telescope so you'd be able to look for those planets better. Pretty amazingly far-sighted guy. So 1948, after the war was over, we also got to finally open up the Palomar Observatory that it had been in preparation for 20 years. 1948 was also the year that Ralph Alpher wrote his thesis on the primordial nucleosynthesis. And could you imagine the 300 people, not quite as big as this audience, but 300 people came to hear the defense. So uh, people thought that was real important at that time. Uh, it was uh, followed up shortly by a paper by Alpher and Herman where they predicted that the universe should be filled with cosmic background radiation at a temperature of about 5 Kelvin. And uh, I don't know if people fully appreciated it at that time, uh, but it would be the dominant radiation, uh, more than 99.9% .9 of all the photons in the universe today. Um, so nobody went and tried to measure. Uh, Joe Weber told me once that uh, he wanted to th try, and people told him it was impossible. So uh, maybe it would have been impossible, but on the other hand, I think Perhaps Robert Dickey could have done it if he'd wanted to. Uh, 1948, also, we got the steady state theory. Uh, people thought, well, we don't like this expanding universe idea. How about an infinite age of the universe? Um, but in order to make that work, you would need continuous creation of matter. And if there were a cosmic background radiation, I don't know if it was even being thought about at that time, it would have to be produced by stars. So then a few more years passed, and uh, the Sputnik turned up. And we started the space age. Uh, the United States was totally alarmed and outraged that uh, this had been happening, um, although it shouldn't have been a surprise. They had been told 25 times in the New York Times that the Sputnik was going to go up. And nevertheless, uh, we didn't know. <laughs> so by the way, the pictures here, uh, that's Herman and Alpha in the upper picture. That's what they looked like when they came to the launch of the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite. And they were so proud that their prediction was finally being tested out so well. And uh, you also recognize that uh, Fred Hoyle there in his car uh, driving on the other side of the road. So 1958, um, NASA was created by Congress. Um, and among all of the federal science agencies, it's the only one which is chartered to explain the answers to the public. Can you imagine that? Um, <clears throat> So a few years after that, uh, Kennedy announces the Apollo program to Congress. Uh, a year after that, uh, John Glenn orbited the Earth, and our space age was really rolling. Uh, then we got the uh, surprise discovery by Penzias and Wilson 
of the cosmic microwave background radiation itself. Now, for them, it was a small signal, very difficult to find and very difficult to prove. Um, they, as, as you all know, they were not looking for it. Uh, Dickey, Peebles, Roll, and Wilkinson were looking for it, but they hadn't quite gotten there yet. So the story is very well known. Uh, uh, Bob Wilson told me when he uh, read about, that he finally believed of the importance of this when he read about it in the New York Times. Because <laughs> uh, yeah, we're experimenters. We don't necessarily believe what the theorists believe. So Hubble didn't believe Lemaitre's story. Well, Wilson didn't immediately believe the theorist's story either. Anyway, uh, then also it didn't take very long before the first uh, uh, term in the uh, anisotropy calculations was made, 67. Uh, Ray Sachs and uh, I forget what his name is, Mr. Wolf, um, his first name, uh, figured out that anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation could come from uh, photons climbing out of primordial gravitational potentials. A redshift would occur, from, and a differential redshift, according to where the photon started in the gravitational potential. So the beginnings of those things were already being figured out a long time ago. So uh, there's the famous picture of the, of the antenna. And I put this here also to, to point out a lovely book by uh, Peebles, Page, and Partridge uh, describing uh, many, many episodes and stories about the, uh, the, person, the people who did this work of finding the Big Bang. So this is the, uh, the graph that uh, many of us on the Cosmic Background uh, team uh, used to think about this expanding universe. And there is the thermal history of the universe, um, a uh, power law uh, relations of uh, temperature intensity versus time, and, uh, and the major transitions. So this is a beautifully clear uh, explanation of what uh, we were going to look for. And uh, sure enough, it turned out uh, to be true. Uh, not to spend time on this, because time is short, uh, what is this timer doing? Anyway, um, uh, there we go. It's doing something. Um, so major events that you all know about, the uh, transition from the hot early universe to the formation of nuclei of helium, then the transition from radiation dominated to matter dominated uh, around the time of the recombination and the time that the universe becomes transparent. So key plot. So more things happened. In 1968, uh, there was a rocket uh, experiment done which showed an excess of the cosmic microwave background radiation about 50 times what was expected. So this was pretty exciting. I think most of us thought it must be wrong. Um, but nevertheless, um, oh, thank you. Nevertheless, uh, it was exciting. So if there were that much up there, it should be easy enough for even a graduate student to find out if it was correct. Uh, the space age was rolling along. Uh, 1969, Armstrong and Aldrin walked on the moon. I was a graduate student at the time, and uh, I had my only summer job outside the laboratory. I was a camp counselor that summer and putting little boys to bed at the time of the, uh, of the moon landing. 1970, we found out that uh, the universe must have a, a, a singularity uh, near the beginning of time. And the, uh, this is from running the uh, general relativity uh, calculations backwards. And um, I think the public widely misinterprets our story to say uh, the universe is a compact set, and therefore um, there was nothing, and then there was something. Uh, I don't think physicists actually say that. We only have laws of, of nature where something turns into something else. So also in 1970, we started understanding that there should be not only anisotropies, but there ought to be scale-free density fluctuations, and the, the papers were about right, uh, based on very general arguments. So this is before we had measured any of those things. Nevertheless, uh, calculations could go forward. They also predicted that the spectrum of the cosmic microwave back radi background radiation could be different from bl black body um, if energy were added to the radiation field after the expansion began, uh, because photons, after a while, are conserved. So then you uh, add energy to the photon field and you get a spectrum with a chemical potential. I'll show you that later. Anyway, you see pictures of some of these folks here. There's a Stephen Hawking looking very young, uh, Roger Penrose, and, uh, and um, Ed Harrison there, where the red arrow is, and uh, Zeldovich there on the postage stamp from, from the Soviet Union, and, uh, and his uh, colleague, Rashid Sunyaev. They all have made enormous contributions to our subject. So here's a, a list of some of those important processes that I mentioned. Um, 
the, uh, if electrons crash into photons and they can create an extra photon in the process, then uh, photons are no longer conserved. This process stops when the uh, redshift of the universe is, a, or the expansion is about two million. Um, after that, we have Compton scattering that can rearrange direction and also change energy of photons, um, but it would preserve the chemical potential form until later um, if there were one. Uh, after that, um, we can have black bodies from different uh, parts of the sky mixing together, and then we would have a spectrum that is uh, basically a superposition of black bodies at different temperatures. Uh, other things that can happen, electrons crash into protons and produce uh, free free radiation. Electrons plus protons turn into uh, hydrogen atoms and they make Lyman alpha and the whole Lyman series of uh, photons. Electrons spin around the magnetic field to make synchrotron radiation. And of course, later on, uh, if there are molecules and ions uh, and atoms, so we can get line emission. So lots of things can happen to the spectrum of the cosmic background radiation from all of these processes. These days, the focus has been on, um, on the anisotropy for a good reason, because it's extraordinarily in interesting. Nevertheless, the spectrum is also interesting. And by the way, this, uh, this first process, the double Compton process, stops after about the first year of the expansion. So if energy were added to the cosmic background field after the first year, uh, we would be able to know about that from the changes of the spectrum. Here are the spectrum in occupation number form. Uh, basically, the Planck function is Johnson noise in three dimensions, so I like to think of that from the engineering direction. Uh, so there, there are simple forms. The dipole is just the derivative of the, uh, of the occupation number with respect to temperature. Uh, the next terms, uh, the chemical potential, you see there that simple form. Uh, now, if you're going to measure these things, you have to, really have to adjust the temperature, which you didn't know either. You have to fit a spectrum to a superposition of all these different forms in order to measure something. But anyway, it's pretty simple, logically. Not simple, technically. So the spectrum could be different from, uh, uh, for a lot of other reasons, um, things that people thought might have happened in the early times. The galaxies might have been made from explosions uh, rather than, as we now think, from gravitation pulling particles together. Uh, might have been wimps being annihilated. What if protons decay? Um, what if there's a hot intergalactic medium, which we now do know exists? Um, lots of other things could add to the cosmic background spectrum. And so um, this now gives us a tool to look into those things. Um, other galaxies, magnetized strings. People used to think, what about uh, cosmic superstrings that uh, could do things? So vast numbers of things have to be thought about if you really want to get the spectrum predictions correct. So now I want to talk about measuring the spectrum. Uh, here are some of the key people that I worked with, uh, in, in directly or indirectly. Uh, Paul Richards was my thesis advisor at UC Berkeley. And I was looking for a thesis in 1970, so I wandered into his lab, and this sounded pretty cool to do. Uh, we were working with Mike Werner from Charles Townsend's lab, and so Mike and I worked together uh, to make a measurement from the, uh, from the ground in White Mountain. David Woody, a, a graduate student with me, um, we worked together on a balloon payload. Frank Lowe, whose picture is in the lower left, was one of the original developers of wonderful infrared detectors, and practically every uh, infrared lab in the country would use his equipment. Herb Gush uh, was our competitor at UC uh, University of British Columbia, and he built sounding rockets uh, to measure the cosmic background radiation. Ray Weiss was a competitor and colleague later at MIT, and uh, so I will show you more about what we all did. Um, this uh, was the state of the art in about 1975. You see various points on the uh, spectrum um, showing measurements of the uh, microwave uh, uh, brightness, also measurements of the interstellar molecules of CN, and finally that uh, thing with a big uh, error bar on it towards the right-hand side, that was our direct measurement from a balloon payload. So uh, would you say that that proves that there's a black body radiation field? Well, maybe, maybe not. So here is Paul Richards, by the way, giving our balloon payload to the Air and Space Museum. Uh, if you go down there and see, you can see it. It's pretty amazing that my thesis project ended up there. So uh, a lot of people were inventing and proposing things in 1970. Um, Martin and Puppet invented the technology for the spectrometer. In 1974, uh, NASA asked for proposals for satellite missions, and we got started. 1976, the COBE satellite team was chosen by NASA headquarters. Here are many of the scientists. Uh, Pat Thaddeus was my postdoctoral advisor in New York, 
here are many of the other people. Um, my time is running short, so I'm going to have to not read out everybody's name. So there are the first uh, members of the science team for the COBE satellite. Um, here are additional people we brought in, Chuck Bennett, Nancy, uh, Ed Chang. Uh, okay, it's a more and more. It took a big crowd of scientists. Uh, and of course, as you know, there were many, many, many more people doing engineering and technical work. A total of about 1,500 people worked on the COBE satellite. Um, in, uh, let's see, what else is happening here? Um, I have to jump ahead. These are three of the people that worked on the inflation theory. Alan Guth, uh, Andre Linde, and Starobinsky, all of whom did these things. Um, by the way, in the 80s, the Challenger was lost, and the COBE satellite had to be reconfigured to go up uh, on, a, on a Delta rocket. Finally went up in 89. That's what it looked like. You've seen these pictures. Um, had two, uh, mic two uh, helium-cooled instruments and one set of microwave radiometers around the outside of the helium cryostat. This is the uh, differential spectrometer that was used to measure the spectrum. Um, the basic point of it is uh, uh, suppress the dynamic range by having a balanced differential system. And I have a, uh, a calibrator here in the upper left, which basically represents the spectrum of the sky. Here's our first result. Uh, the, the, these days, our spectrum has been replaced by a, a line which is so clear that you can't see the error bars. They're about 50 parts per million. This is the other, uh, micro, the other system we had on board, uh, differential microwave radiometers. Uh, again, using the, oops, using the, uh, the uh, cancellation of a differential system to uh, reduce dynamic range and raise the gain. So uh, from that, we made our famous maps uh, showing the first measurements of the cosmic anisotropy. Uh, after removing the dipole and the uh, galactic signal, we got a map of the cosmos, which uh, started off an amazing, uh, an amazing uh, period of, uh, of uh, additional experiments. So um, we got a few surprises. Uh, there's my, our final temperature. Can you imagine getting that many decimal places on the cosmic temperature, 2.72548? That's the result of Dale Fixen's work, who was extraordinarily good at that. Uh, Herb Gush, with his sounding rocket team, uh, confirmed our result almost immediately, within weeks after our satellite launch got the same answer, which made us all feel good. Um, Hubble went up a few months later. And then uh, the next year, Ned Wright uh, analyzed our maps from the microwave radiometer and came to the science team and said, you know what? There's anisotropy in these maps. There are blobs. And we all said, that's interesting. We better be sure. And so we all went back and uh, did a whole host of tests of the data because this wasn't that long after polywater and uh, cold fusion reports, and we thought, we sure don't want to be in that category. So we worked really, really hard. And among other things, uh, we had a, uh, a, an, an internal measurement. That the maps made at 23 gigahertz with our balloon payload that we had, uh, some of our team members had done. So we knew that we already had some confirmation already. Then uh, shortly after the project was over, uh, I got a, head, a phone call from NASA headquarters. It's time to start the new telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. So that's what I've been doing ever since. Then uh, three years after that, we got the, the uh, cosmic acceleration was discovered, and uh, that was pretty amazing, too. So um, the uh, CMB work continued, and uh, the first uh, tentative discussion of the acoustic peak of the fluctuations came uh, in 1999. Then in 2001, the WMAP was launched. I'll show you a little bit about that. And uh, they eventually got extraordinarily good uh, measurements of the cosmic parameters down to a few percent, uh, discovering that they could measure the reionization epoch and, uh, from the polarization, and even could uh, confirm the number of neutrino flavors. Uh, around the same time, uh, Wendy Friedman's key project got a, the modern value for the Hubble constant. Uh, and finally, at long last, we got uh, an understanding of the universe that's roughly consistent with the ages of stars. 2009, the Planck mission went up. And also in 2009, we found out uh, that uh, lensing deviations uh, by the cosmic uh, gravitational fields were enough to considerably move the little random spots of the microwave radiation from place to place. I was completely amazed to realize that the typical lensing deviation back towards the beginning was two and a half arc minutes, which is bigger than the angular resolution of the human eye. I never guessed we would be able to have a hint of that. 
So here's the W map. Uh, Chuck Bennett was the PI, uh, and he uh, led a Prince team with Goddard and Princeton, and they launched it in 2001 and ran for nine years. Here's another instrument, uh, by the way, that's differential. There are two completely identical inputs that are being differenced internally um, and producing these amazing and wonderful maps. So um, moving on after that, of course, the project the progress does not stop. Um, we got a few more surprises. You might not know how hard it is to measure the cosmic spectrum, uh, but we didn't all give up. Um, here is a remarkably clever uh, design made at Goddard uh, Space Flight Center, we flew a balloon payload, uh, Al Kogut led this mission, um, a balloon payload uh, with hundreds and hundreds of liters of liquid helium, uh, so much of it that it, as it boiled off, uh, it would make a kind of helium dome over the top of the payload, and you could have a, uh, a calibrator and a whole microwave system uh, completely cooled down to the lowest temperature necessary without even having to have a window overhead. So this was a... Uh, a uh, completely amazing thing, and they got answers uh, that are consistent with a black body, but almost, but not quite. So notice there's an excess brightness of the cosmic background radiation spectrum at a few gigahertz frequency. So it's prop I think it might be right, uh, but it's certainly not explained. It definitely is what was measured. So then the Planck mission comes along. Uh, it's got uh, higher spatial resolution and sensitivity than the WMAP, primarily because they operate at shorter wavelengths um, and because the aperture of the observatory is about the same as it was for WMAP. So there it is spinning in space. Good, okay. So there's their map, uh, basically agrees with the others. We've been very blessed in our subject that all of these improved observatories can keep on getting answers that are about in agreement with one another. We have not found ourselves to be in great mistake. Uh, this is the angular power spectrum that they got, uh, and you can see this amazing uh, t picture with almost invisible error bars, uh, and to me this is a stunning achievement for our field. Uh, and uh, it fits the, uh, the, uh, the theory that we have for this, the standard uh, model of cosmology, uh, extraordinarily well. So people ask me occasionally, well, are there going to be any surprises here? And it's hard to think of what we're going to be surprised at since everything's working so well. Nevertheless, stuff happens. So um, do not be too surprised if after all this work we still find a, a surprise. So Planck has measured the polarization of the cosmic background radiation, and there are, is a, a beautiful map from it. Um, you can see that it's got polarization. Um, I do not know how to read this map to tell you exactly what it means, but uh, as you know, we try to divide this polarization into two parts, a part that has divergence and a part that has curl. And um, the part that has curl and no divergence is thought to be uh, primordial, at least on large angular scales, as long as we can uh, remove the effects of the foreground. So that's a, a work in progress still to understand the polarization, and we hope to know what it means soon. So what's coming in the next 50 years? Well. Uh, this year, anyway, we have several meetings. Uh, there's a, a, a Cosmic Background at 50 meeting in Princeton uh, this uh, spring. Also a, a, a meeting on how to measure the spectrum distortion even better out in Chicago. Uh, we will understand soon what the measurements are telling us about Cosmic Background polarization, uh, large scales and small scales, uh, where you have to account for the lensing effects. Eventually, I think we could make a thousand-fold improvement on the spectrum distortion. Uh, and at that point, you would be able to tell a lot of things we can't tell yet. Uh, I think the prediction that there must be a distortion is pretty sound. Uh, exactly what we will find when we get there, I don't know. Uh, a remarkable turn of events is that it's even possible to measure the distortion of the cosmic background spectrum down in the 100 megahertz region if you can get a payload out uh, far from Earth and put it in the shadow of the moon, where it's uh, in the shadow of the moon and, uh, and protected from uh, the Earth and the Sun at the same time, it's dark enough and quiet enough out there that we should be able to measure the effects of the redshifted 21 centimeter hydrogen lines on the spectrum of the cosmic background radiation and uh, learn about the, uh, the temperature history of the electrons uh, after decoupling. Eventually, I think we'll be able to interpret the quantum fluctuations of the early universe, uh, possibly even test alternative gravity theories. Uh, come back to the, hear the other talks today. Um, I think we might be able to do some lab tests of simulated general relativity and quantum gravity. 
and I've been intrigued for many years with this uh, work by Volovic on the uh, on this on the parallels between uh, some certain uh, low temperature uh, f uh, phenomena in superfluid helium three and the real universe that we live in. Sometime we're going to have a new quantum gravity, and then we'll come back and say, well, "Why was it so hard?" <laughs> that could happen. So. In 2065, me look back and say it's so simple. That's how I felt when I finished uh, learning uh, vector vector uh, E and M. It seemed so simple at the end, and it was so hard at the beginning. So thank you very much for thinking with me and hearing the story about the the past 50 years, 100 years, and possibly the next 50. So if we have just a few minutes for questions, I'm not sure how our calendar has worked out, but yes, uh, here we are. Thank you. So we have time for questions. People that would like to ask questions are asked to move to the microphones to my left and my right. Oh, Arthur, Arthur Wolf. Yes, Virginia remembers it was Arthur Wolf. Virginia knows everything. Uh, yes, I know. <laughs> if anybody has questions, please move to the microphone. Here's a softball. Um, tell us what the, uh, the James Webb Telescope will add to the uh, cosmological story. Ah, um, it's, not, it's not measuring microwaves, of course. Um, but the uh, James Webb Telescope uh, was originally conceived primarily the, as the hardest problem to solve was going to be understanding the formation of the galaxies. Where did the galaxies come from? How did they grow for the primordial fluctuations? Um, when we started, we didn't even know about the acceleration. So that was back in 95. It hadn't been discovered yet. So uh, now people anticipate that we can measure the acceleration a lot better uh, because uh, the supernova technique can be applied much better using infrared standard candles where the obscuration by, um, by dust is also smaller. Uh, so that will help with the dark energy question. Um, dark matter, I'm not quite sure what we're going to find. It wasn't conceived as a, a mapping device for dark matter, but nevertheless, um, with a very much larger number of uh, t tiny remote galaxies, we should be able to measure the uh, gravitational effects of dark matter in the nearby things even better. Uh, so um, those are some of the things. I would certainly like to know how do the gal galaxies make black holes or vice versa. And so uh, these are kind of cosmic questions that still, I think, are very exciting. So, yeah. And by the way, it's on track for launch in October 2018. So if uh, you have uh, colleagues and students that want to learn how to work it, we have a uh, workshop training uh, next month in Baltimore here. Uh, so students should look for, for the uh, user training workshop. Proposals are due in uh, three years, less, less than three years. <laughs> Thank you. Are there further questions? John, in... Uh one of the Indiana Jones movies, he says when you understand everything, that's usually when the uh, floor falls away from your feet. And looking at those uh, uh, CMB uh, uh, plots with the amazingly small error bars, do you have any speculations as to what direction our next surprise might come from? Um, golly gee, if I really knew, I would be working on it for sure. Um, <laughs> but um, I think we're going to find something interesting from the spectrum distortions. Um, I used, Rashid Sunyaev has been persuading me for years that we have to measure better. And I thought, well, I, if all I'm going to find out is that you know how to calculate, that's not exciting enough, because I already know that. Um, but if there are some surprises that the universe has in terms of the history of energy release, uh, suppose there are unstable wimps out there that are annihilating and turning into energy fields. Well, this is a way we might find out. That's one. We could get a lot of surprises when we finally get the, the uh, cosmic polarization map understood. Maybe it's not what everybody thought it was. Um, so that's in the CMB area. Now, uh, I guess I have no idea whether Einstein was totally right or not. Somebody else will tell us today, I think. That's right. Are there further questions? If not, let's thank John again from Marvelous okay. Thank you, Ian. Yeah. Thank you.